Welcome back again to this tutorial series on OWASP top 10 and understanding what these vulnerabilities actually mean, what they look like and how we can spot them and fix them. Uh, I apologize for the amount of time it's taken me to put these together, but it's not usually at the presentation that takes the time. It is putting together some kind of code examples in order to demonstrate these things. Fortunately, A7 is quite an easy subject to explain, and we'll see it in a minute. It is called missing function level access control. So this means you might have access control at another level. So you might have a login page, and that login page might allow you to access certain other pages in the menu. But function level access control is having some kind of mechanism at a much smaller level, a very specific level, to check whether the current user is permitted to carry out the action. So in most web applications, it's common that some kind of authorization check is used in order to perhaps put certain items on the menu to perhaps show and hide different sections on a page. So you might say, Everyone can see this page, but if you are an administrator, perhaps you get another section at the bottom or maybe you get some additional buttons to edit and delete things. Um, but the problem is if you don't have function level access control, as soon as an attacker becomes aware of these other functions, then they can attempt to call them even if they don't have a button or even if they don't have a section on the page. So even though you're not making it easy for them, they can still send a request through to the web server and if those functions are not checking that the user has permission to perform that action then you are vulnerable to a7 now a lot of the stuff i'm going to talk about is very similar to a4 which was the uh, direct object reference and the the kind of uh, protection is roughly the same for both so if you think you've heard some of this before you probably already have. But this is kind of more specifically to do with somebody carrying out an action rather than somebody accessing some kind of object. But you'll see they're pretty much the same thing as far as uh, as, as far as their um, the way to fix it is concerned. So this is, if you like, a class of vulnerability that we would call escalation of privilege. In other words, I'm either an anonymous user, an attacker as an anonymous user, trying to get access to functionality that's only available to authenticated users. If the attacker has no way to authenticate, then they might escalate privilege just to become a user. And perhaps a more obvious or common example would be an attacker who has a user account, but who wants to access administrator type functions. Now, it's interesting just to note while, while we're here that there is a much easier way to block administrative functions from your website, and that is to have a separate web application to perform administrative functions. That's what I've done at work. Uh, one of our um, live production sites, there, uh, there are no administrative functions. So when I log into our public site, then I see exactly the same as everybody else sees. And that just removes a whole load of dangers because it means I don't need to test for escalation of privilege. I don't need to make sure that all of my administrator functions are blocked. Instead, what I do is I have an administrator site which is internal to our network and which has a raft of other security measures so that a public attacker cannot even access that. Now that might not be possible, and even if it is possible, then you still need to be, be aware of whether this, uh, this idea of function level access control is or isn't relevant to you. So how common is this, uh, this idea? Well, sadly, the lack of function level access control, access control seems to be very common uh, across the web. In some instances, if you've got a high value application, then you're more likely to have function level access control. But one of the problems with this mechanism, as various other controls, is that it's very hard for the framework to enforce this automatically. So let's say you think, oh, let's use .NET or let's use Java or, or something like that, thinking they're kind of really high quality commercial frameworks. Well, that's true, but they also don't enforce authorization automatically because you might not need it, you might not want it. 
uh, and lots of these frameworks are the same. They don't have a secure method by default, which is a shame, but that's kind of how it is. And so it's just another thing that we need to add to our processes, to our checklists, to make sure that we're doing it properly. So how do we fix it? Well, let's kind of look. I've got here um, some kind of examples of some code. So there's two different things we're doing here. This is an example from a framework called Yi. Uh, I'm quite fond of it. It's PHP, but that doesn't really matter. The kind of gist of what we see here uh, is the same in other frameworks. Uh, and in this case, there's kind of a couple of different ways that you can implement this function level access control. So if you look here at the top, we would have what we would call a declarative statement so we're saying here basically in strings in this case for these actions apply sign up and log out then uh, the sign up action is only available to people who are not authenticated because if you are authenticated you don't need to sign up and if you want to log out or apply uh, apply is not um, the same as sign up it's something different for this website then that app symbol in this case in the case of Yi says that you have to be an authenticated user because if you're not or it means you're actually authenticated and logged in so you obviously don't want to log out unless you're logged in and in our case our business logic says you can't call the apply action unless you are an authenticated user so this is kind of quite basic stuff uh, this is one way of achieving function level access control in um, in Yi. Of course, one of the dangers here is that there's nothing to stop me adding another type of action down here and not putting it into a rule. So again, the framework's not going to tell me if I've missed something. And by default, if I don't have an access rule, unless I configure it to block everything by default, then I'm going to end up with an uh, unsecured action. So that might be a problem so that's the declarative way the the second way is kind of to do it in code effectively so here's an example in a different controller where we have the delete action so if you've ever used mvc most of you probably have then this is the delete action in this case in a controller called the camper controller and you notice here that i have a piece of code that basically says can the user do this now this is something that i have uh, coded so i've chosen that name it's not a special name it's just a name i've used to declare a permission about whether somebody is allowed to delete a camper and it passes in the id of the camper that the person is trying to delete and this what this does i'll explain in a minute is it, it obviously checks the permission and if the answer is no you're not allowed to do it then in the case of ye we throw one of these forbidden exceptions and a forbidden exception is a 403 which comes by well, 403 or 401 whichever one it is look doesn't really matter too much 403 which will go back and say to the browser you're not allowed to do this now we wouldn't normally that's not a very nice looking page i could make it look nicer but the point is this should never happen because somebody should never see a delete link for an id that they don't own so i'm not too bothered of, about the fact that that looks quite ugly when it's displayed to the user but um, like I say, what you try and do is you try and stop people doing the wrong thing by setting up your user interface correctly. However, if they start changing numbers in the URL bar, trying to hack these numbers or whatever they might try and do, uh, whether that's just people playing around or whether it's somebody having a real attack on your site, then we have this mechanism here, in here to say something very specific. And of course, we can have any logic in here that makes sense. But this uses something called role-based access control. Now, um, a lot of frameworks have an equivalent. And the idea of role-based ac uh, role access control, very simply, you have a permission. And the permission is assigned to various roles. So a role could be as simple as user or administrator. On some systems, you could have 10, 20, 30 roles. Well, it, it just depends on what you want to do. And then individual users get assigned to those roles. So on this site, when somebody signs up, they're automatically given the user role. Whereas certain people, there's about four of us, 
uh, in this instance have the administrator role so then what happens is I can map various permissions I can say that um, an, an administrator is always allowed to delete a camper um, otherwise a user can only delete a camper th that they have created but notice that none of that logic is in here the only thing I've done is I've called this function in the case of year it's called can if user can or in this case if not user can do this then you throw an exception and all of the logic about who can do what is all stored in a database in a load of role based access control tables so you might hear that phrase are back um, to describe that there are simpler ways of course that you can do access control you could simply have something here if user is administrator they can do it otherwise they can't but the nice thing about role based access control is it's very flexible and what you don't end up with is an application that starts out okay and then all of a sudden you need to add a different piece of functionality and it breaks all of your um, authorization system because it's not flexible enough so in some ways it's nice to start with the flexibility it takes a little longer to set up in, mo in the case of most frameworks but not a great deal of time and the other thing is once you've used it several times then you'll get really really used to doing it quickly setting it up quickly giving yourself maybe two roles to begin with a few basic permissions but then already having the mechanism in place if you do want to change things in the future you can do it very easily and in the case of Yi, uh, I've written some da database scripts that will actually populate the database with all of the permissions. So I don't have to go through and do that manually. But um, like I say, this is called role-based access control. Uh, I'll say it again. I've said it before. You need to have a code review checklist. If you want to write anything securely and you don't have a checklist, how are you going to make sure that you remember next time everything that you need to do? So you have a checklist. One of the items on your checklist is going to be, have I checked for authorization or permissions on this action? Yes, no. It's just a checklist. You look at it and you go, oh, no, I've forgotten. And you put in the relevant stuff. So this is something very easy to fix because there's just a couple of lines of code. But you need to make sure you remember to do it. And that's where the checklist comes in. Uh, in some frameworks, you might be able to do something to force you to put in the uh, permissions in .NET, for instance, you could add an attribute to all of your actions or even to the controllers as you create them, which basically says if there's no permission specified, then throw a 403 automatically. So you could build that in. But the main thing is, like with all of these uh, top 10 issues, make sure you have something. And if you have something, you can always improve it over time. So let me try and resume the slideshow because, uh, yep, that's in the right place. So we've kind of already, I've already shown you this, but every piece of functionality um, that is not well, that is not permitted to all users needs a function level access check. Now, okay, we could take this to an extreme, but you could say, well, what about, um, you know, shouldn't all functions have authorization? Well, you could do. It's not a problem. If your site is private, then you will need to anyway. Do you need um, access checks on the index page of the front of the app? Blah, if you want, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. But definitely for all pieces of functionality that are not open to all users, you need some code or other to make that check. Um, and like I said in the second point here, it's it's okay to check for a permission even if everyone has permission to do it. So again, what that might help you to do is make it be the normal thing that you do on every action is to apply the check. So it's okay to put it on even if everyone's allowed access to it. And as I've said many times, and I'll say again, use a code review checklist to make sure that every time you're checking in code, to source control uh, every time you're reviewing someone else's code however you do it at your organization or in your bedroom wherever you code have a code review checklist and then it's the simplest thing in the world to read a line off the checklist put the authorization check in and it's done done and dusted so like i say a7 pretty straightforward to understand pretty straightforward to fix and really, this is one of those things where you just need to get into a good habit. If you get into a good habit, then it shouldn't really cause you any problems.
So thanks for listening to one of my shortest videos ever. And I will hopefully get on to do uh, A8 uh, later on. A8, by the way, is uh, cross-site request forgery. That might take me a little time to set up. But hopefully I'll get that done tonight as well. Any questions or comments, as usual, please put them underneath on YouTube. And I'll try and reply to them um, as soon as I can. Thanks very much.